thank you, Lord, the fruit of our lips, giving praise to our God. God, rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy.
seed but of incorruptible by the word of God that lives and abides forever. You could have stepped into creation with fire for all to see brought every tribe and nation to their knees. Arriving with the host of heaven and royal robe and crown, the rulers of the earth all bowing down. But you chose meekness over majesty. Wrapped your power in humanity. Glory be to you alone, King who reigns from a manger throne. My life, my praise. Into the heart of Rome Showed them splendor like they'd never known But you wrote a bitter story In humble Bethlehem Creator in the arms of common men You will die for our redemption so we can live Glory be to you alone King who reigns from a manger throne My life, my praise, everything I own To Jesus, the King on a man has overcome let heaven and nature sing this is our king from heaven to the cradle from cradle to the cross let heaven and nature 
ever see. This is our king. But the grave couldn't hold him. Jesus has overcome. Let heaven and nature sing. This is our king. All hail the king. All hail the king. an introduction by turning to uh, Revelation 4, a few verses for our message. Welcome Pastor Shabelli back from Latin America. He <clears throat> also there's a concert in Turkey that has been going on in the last few days and and I've heard uh, um, in Oman, uh, Oman celebration, Christmas celebration. Uh, I'm sure this week in India, there's a lot of a lot of ministry happening in India this week for Christmas, and and it's a great time of year. I I want to draw your attention to something here in Revelation four. 11, chapter 5, and chapter 7 for a few moments. Okay, first of all, chapter 4, verse 11. Thou art worthy, O God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. We could say this, uh, ask a question to you and myself. What, is you, what are you here for? Why do you exist? Why have you been created? The answer is there in that verse. We have been created for his pleasure. We are here for him. We are here because he made us in his image and he enjoys us. 
We are made in his image. We are in his family. We are made for his pleasure. Isn't that a good verse, verse 11? Yeah. What are you doing on earth? What's your job? What's your family like? How much money do you make? Are you educated or not? Where do you live and what's your life like? How long do you live? Do you live 30 years or uh, 100 years? What, how, what, what's your story? And the answer is, we are made for the glory of God. We are created for his pleasure. Nothing matters more than that. It isn't my status in society or how long I live. It is that my life is for his pleasure. And he determines that, doesn't he? He determines the length of our life and many other things. He is God. He is sovereign. Now, notice something. Get a get shift to what is happening in heaven predominantly like often, if not always, what is happening? What is the nature of heaven? What is it? But they are overwhelmingly occupied with God. They see God. They know God. They are in the presence of God. And what does it produce in us? But these words, glory and honor. Look at chapter 5. Verse 12, saying with a loud voice, these are thousands. Let's look at verse 11. 11. I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. Now, these are angels. And the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. What are the angels doing there? This relates to the incarnation, by the way, because that will be our message this morning the incarnation of Christ, the coming of Christ, born in Bethlehem, God becoming, coming here, incarnated. And the angels in heaven, in this particular instance, after the resurrection and the ascension of Christ, before the great tribulation period, there's a context, but I want, I, I, that's another message, but I want you to see what's happening. They, verse 12, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Seven words, I believe. Mm -hmm. Now this is, where this world is going. It's like our, our, the big, the big, the big um, consummation, the reality. When we, reality hits, there is this, this understanding, this understanding that, wow, what? It's like, wow, amazing. That's why we were born that's what God was doing. That's it. That we are in the presence of God, recognizing like the awareness of it, the reality of it overwhelms us. The angels in us too. We are there also. Uh, verse 13. Every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth as such as are in the sea, and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. I'm sure, I'm sure you kind of don't get this. I know that. And, and I don't either, but I do. I, I get it. I, I'm learning it. I'm thinking about it a lot. What's the... The natural man, the natural man, he, he sees only life without God. He doesn't care about God, doesn't see life with God. It's nothing. It doesn't mean anything to him. He is blinded by his sin. He's blinded by, his, by the fall. He doesn't have God. He doesn't know God, doesn't know the things of God. 
but the angels do. And I, with my iPad, I, I want to share something more about it uh, later in the message. Now turn to chapter 7. <clears throat> we have again verse 11, chapter 7. The angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. Now, what's the meaning of the word glory? What's the meaning of it, the, way, the word glory? It means weight. It, it, it actually has that meaning in the Hebrew of weight or value. And uh, glory, and, and you can see it in our world, like when a little boy gets a trophy for playing tennis or football, or a pianist gets an award, gets a trophy, and it is glory, the weight. They, they are the ba best mathematician in the university. So they get, that, they get that honor, that weight they get. They are the best mathematician. Uh, sometimes people wear hats that are for their glory, like a baseball hat or a, a policeman or a crown, a king, or a dignitary, or a turban, or a woman with a hat, a spring hat, a fancy hat, a big hat, a modest hat. It's crowning the head. We are made for this. We are made for a trophy, a ribbon, our name in the paper, our name on a rock along the highway, carved into a tree, you know. Tom loves Lisa. <laughs> you know, we, we are made for uh, memory. We are made for honor. We are made for glory. But these are, these are things that are human that reflect something higher. And what we are talking about is something extraordinarily, unbelievably important to us. And if we miss that, or we don't have the ultimate purpose for our creation, that we are made to please God and glorify God, that you have this glory given to you that you could actually glorify or bring the honor that is due to God is coming from our lives. And more, actually, coming from the angels and everything that God has created. It's where we're going. It's like what it means. Um, yesterday, uh, with my sister and other family members, we were visiting my brother who's passing away. He's, uh, in a few days, 70 years old. Um, he's had a very tough life. Um, um, we were, we've been estranged for some years, uh, but standing by his bedside as he is um, uh, under hospice care and getting the care he needs as he's going to die in a few days. And all of us, uh, it was amazing the bond, the bond that we have. He's my brother, and my sister's there, and we're we are, we are weeping, we are talking, we are, we are relaxed, we are appreciating what God gave us as a family years ago in Rome, New York. And we were in Utica. But being there provoked a meditation in my heart about life. Because he graduated from Penn State, but he also suffered mental sickness schizophrenia, uh, paranoia, which ruined his life. And um, he was homeless, he, he suffered a lot, he was, uh, and all of these things. And then you think about his childhood and, and childhood stories that we mentioned and talked because he could hear us as we were gathered around him in the room. And I want to, like with the iPad, uh, iPad uh, 
a little later, kind of just draw a couple points and speak about the natural man, uh, the the uh, demon demons, and how they see life, how they see this world. How do demons see this world? What a good question. I have a couple of things to say, not a lot, but a couple of things to provoke your understanding. When Christ came into the world, it shook the, it shook the world. Yeah, because the angels learn by what they see, by what they hear in heaven, what they know in heaven, and then what they saw when Christ was born in Bethlehem. So we have the natural man, we have demons, we have the saved people, and then you have um, angels, and then God. So that'll be our, um, our commentary this morning. But this is a starting point. Did we read the verse, chapter 7, verse 12? Saying, Amen. These are the angels around the throne. Blessing, glory. Now, wait a minute, last point. Maybe it's the last. <laughs> happiness, happiness. Do you know when, when you, you see something happen that's glory, maybe earthly picture would be your daughter plays the violin very well. You go to her recital or you go to a concert and your daughter is on the stage playing a violin. And you, what, what happens to the parent? Parent, what? Parent sees their daughter. There is glory, that's weight, given to your daughter. Your daughter is honored, and she has honor. What does it do to you? Joy, Joy happiness. I believe that in heaven, there's an increase in happiness when people see that God on the earth do things. When God is on the earth and he does things, the angels rejoice. Luke 15, verse 10. When a sinner is converted, there is a party in heaven. The angels rejoice in heaven. Like when you see, like when, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem and the angels saw, they were like glory to God in the highest, okay? What does it mean? That, the, that God would do that. Because for 4,000 years, if you use that number from the beginning with Adam, the angels didn't know how God would save the world. How could God take a sinful man and make him a saint? The angels did not know how that would happen. The angels saw the blood of animals, but the angels did not see Christ come. It did not happen until a certain time. And when it happened at a certain time, they sang, they visited the shepherds, and they told the shepherds, go and see. Now, spiritual beings see life a lot better than we do. We don't understand these things. We are limited, but we are learning them. So when I'm standing next to my brother who's passing, and he is a believer, I think of how life can be bad and meaningless. Because at the end of your life, okay, you graduated from Penn State, or you accomplished this or that, or you had a motorcycle, or you owned a house, or this or that. But at the end of your life, what does it mean? What's the value of your life? What is the value of our life? And here it is, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save us, to bring us into his family, to forgive us of our sins, to give to us eternal life, 
and that he will one day, my brother will one day be there before the throne of God, saying glory to God in the highest. Yeah, right? He'll be saying, like all of us will be saying, we'll be saying what happened in our life was, was really, it was messy. What happened in our life was, it might have been hard. What happened in our life was definitely not the way I would have chosen it to go or what happened in my life. But God be glorified and praised that he came to save us that he was humble and came into this world to bring us into his kingdom, and that this life was short, 70 years. It's a vapor, but in that life, by God's grace, somehow you understood the importance of believing in Christ, and in believing you're regenerated. And there is value in your life because God bought you. God paid the price for you. God redeemed you. God sent his spirit into you and I. And we are here for the glory of God. The angels sing it here in chapter 7. Blessing and glory and wisdom and honor, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. I'll finish now. I think that if even for a second the curtain could be pulled back and we realize what this is, it's to the glory of God. The value, what it, what it means, what God has done, what God did, where the grace of God, that God did this, we will see it. Now we see through a glass darkly. We're very much occupied with our stuff, our lives. You know, we're very much occupied with that, and I understand that. And yet, um, a Christmas season is an amazing time of year because we just stop and we just say, wait, this is what God did. And what God did is what lasts and is so full, full of meaning that it will resonate forever and ever. And the angels are learning from it, and we also, and, uh, and that's it. Amen. Amen. Lord bless us. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so Pastor Chabelle, would you like to pray for the offering? Give a little report. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Glory to God. Um, just came back from Latin America. Is that how you say it? Latin America. And we had almost every, I think every country in Latin America was either in Chile or Argentina. It was an amazing time. And to me, these, uh, these trips, these visits, these um, conferences are just a great blessing. Somebody said to me, like, well, this, isn't that traveling difficult? I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. And uh, my wife said to me, well, that was uh, 787 airplane trips. You hit 787. I said, I haven't even begun. 787, that's all? Just 787 airplanes? Up, down, up, down, up, down. Maybe that's why I can't hear. That could be possible. But uh, in considering the offering, and uh, I thank you so much as a, a ministry, those who are here, those who are watching online, those who come at the 11 o'clock service, that you, you give. Because you give, we can go. That's, that's, there's no doubt about that. 
Uh, and that's the glory of God. See God glorified. Uh, just connecting to what Pastor Shallow was saying. The Father gave the Son glory. The Son gave the Spirit glory. The Spirit gave the church glory. The church gave the gospel glory. The gospel gave life glory. I mean, the grace given by God is to his glory. So when we think about the offering this morning, it's just, it's all grace and it's all to the glory of God. All to the glory of God. Sometimes we can think about our financial situations in life and yes, and it can kind of run through my mind and whatnot, but we desire so much to glorify God, to glorify God. And grace giving glorifies God. So as you give today, remember, it's to the glory of God. Father, thank you. Thank you for, in giving, by grace, we see glory. We see the glory of God. It is wisdom to give. It glorifies God. It is an honor to give. It glorifies God. We thank you. We pray that you bless the offerings today, 9, 11, tonight at 6.30. And we thank you, God, for a grace-giving God. The Father gave the Son. The Son gave the Spirit. The Spirit gave the church. The church gave the gospel. And the gospel gave life. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Breaking through the silence with glory in the highest, the hope of all creation, resting in his mother's arms. Song on the horizon, ringing through the heavens, on the way to Savior.
Good morning. Um, so we just want to uh, take a moment and welcome anyone that is here at a Greater Grace service for the first time. So if this is your first Greater Grace service, uh, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand, we'd love to welcome you and, and recognize you. Oh, thank you, sir in the back. Yeah, awesome. Uh, any, anyone else? Um, so we, uh, if, if you could, after the service, please stop by our Welcome Center. We have a gift for you, and we'd uh, like to give you a little more information about us and uh, all that's going on here at the church. So just a few announcements. Um, the Christmas Eve services, um, it's already a week from today. <laughs> um, uh, we will have the 9 a.m. and the 11 a.m. service as normal, um, but the candlelight service in the evening will be at 5 o'clock. So um, just mark that down in your calendars. Uh, there will also be a Christmas Day outreach at 8 a.m., and we'll meet at the Family Center for that. Um, if you want to donate items for, uh, for that outreach, um, and the homeless ministry, they need uh, warm winter clothing and blankets and you can bring those to the inReach department um, if you have those to donate. And you can see Pastor Dan at the Welcome Center after the service for more info as well. Also, uh, this is exciting. So Grace Publications uh, has worked during the last two years editing uh, what was formerly known as the, the Greater Grace Glossary. And it's now being re-released um, as a practical Bible dictionary and it's uh, for sale now uh, this Sunday in the cafe, so you can pick that up as well. Um, and, and lastly, um, the face-to-face -face service for Kobe Wistera uh, is this afternoon at 1 o'clock after the 11 a.m. service. Um, if, and if you could, uh, please stand. And just uh, give Christmas greetings to your neighbor, okay? Thank you. Okay, you may be seated. I think it happens in our services that the Holy Spirit ministers to us and reveals Christ to us. And that's such an honor that we get to know Christ and we hear him, we see him in the body and in life. It's, it's, a big, it's a big honor for us and we're very thankful for that. I would, I would like to start the message up by, by drawing a couple little pictures just because they help us, I think, a little bit. We have God, who is three persons, and they've always been. This is John. I've got John 1.1. 1, 1. We could turn there for the text, one of the 
text John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God or is God. There's no question about it in studying that verse that the Word is God. And the Word was with God. So we have a good verse for thinking about the Trinity, which is a beautiful mystery for us that God is three. God is love, loving the beloved, and it returns back. So love is plural, and we know that that's a, a very simple principle of life with persons. If you're a person, you love a person, person loves you back. If God is a person, then who is he loving but himself? But it's not him, it's another. But it's him, the same God, always has been, always will be. The same was in the beginning, even if, it was, if it's still not clear. Listen to this. The same was in the beginning with God. This is the word. So we have two. We have the word God and we have the word word. And later in the text, you see the word became flesh. Verse 14. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So this is the word who is God is with God, and he made everything. Look at verse 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So he was not made, as the Jehovah Witnesses teach and Mormons teach. Those are not Christian groups. They, they do not believe in the incarnation of God, that God became flesh, that the Word became flesh, and the Word was God, and was with God, and that he made everything. He was not made himself. He, he was the one that made everything that is. There isn't anything that he didn't make. And in him was life, verse 4, and the life was the light of men, and the light shine, shines in darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. So we have the first comment here. We, we have a, a four or five of them here. Here I'll draw it this way. There is the Trinity. This is God. And, and the Son always, this is important, John 17, 5, he had glory with the Father. When he was human and, and he was incarnated, but he was, when he came into the world, he left his glory. He left those privileges of being sovereign and omniscient, omnipresent. He had that in his nature, but as a man, he humbled himself and didn't we can't say it strictly, but in general, he didn't utilize it. He wasn't, he wasn't walking around as God without being submitted always to the Father. And if it meant suffering for him, he took the suffering if it meant he was obedient to the Father. So always he was obedient to the Father in John 5.19 and 5.30, and therefore, we see his humility. We see his submission. We could say in the administration of God, we could write it this way, administration of the Godhead, the Father is the head, the Son is submitted, and the Holy Spirit is the one that is manifesting the reality, showing, re 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 manifesting, the reality, the content between them, the Father and the Son, is the Holy Spirit, who is the, communi in com the communicator in the Godhead, if we could say it that way. So we have the Godhead, we have the administration, 
and the Father having the plan always from the time when God created man. So it's right that right, I, I want to I want to do God. I'd like to do um, angels. Uh, saved man, saved man, demons, and then unsaved man. And their, their mentality, I think maybe we could just say their mentality, their way of, their perception of things. Why? why? Because it, it's... Uh, a joy for us to think about the reality of the world we are in that is beyond the material world. Many, many people, this, this unsaved man category, they believe only in the material world. The only reality there is is that one, this one here. Okay, that's reality. Um, but... Um, so we have the atheists and indifferent people and only care, care about their stomach or their hormones or their, their appearance or their things or possessions or their, and those kind of things. That's the mentality. But we have been, we have woken up, we have been awakened to the reality of God by his grace by sending his spirit into us. Look at John 1, verse 14. The word was made flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We actually have seen God, John 14, 9. We have seen God when we see him we actually see God, but God isn't law. He's not the law. God is more mystical, more spiritual. God is not the law, but this is the unsaved man thinks of religion in terms of law. But we see it in terms of grace and truth. We touch the person of God. That God came into the world to touch us, not, not to condemn us or destroy us, but to save us, to show us that life is more than flesh and blood. Nicodemus, you must be born of the Spirit. If you're not of the Spirit, then you cannot see. You cannot behold. I am the light of the world. I am, I am what you need. I am the one that will show you that there's, there are actually demons, there are actually angels, there actually is heaven, and there is actually hell. Where, what is hell? It's the place for the unsaved people to go because there's no place for them. They have no place to be with God. They are not with God. They are lost. Their sins started when they were born and it never ended. They die in their sin. They are without God. They, they contradict God's reality. They have been deceived and blinded by being lost in our sin. It was our state. It was what, the way we lived. It was like how many people think of Christmas as simply a holiday to drink or party or something like that. It's not the birthday, or it's not the incarnation, it's not the incredible gift that has changed our lives and given us a new understanding. Now let's go back to God in heaven and go to the angels here. Let's turn to, um, let, let's stay in John 1, one, one or two more verses here. One Chapter 1, verse... Um, uh, 15, 16, and 17, and 18. 
John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have we all received grace for grace. Not, nor the law was given by, for the law was given by Moses, and grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. He hath declared him, or he has, he has brought him out, out from the heart. He, he abides in the bosom, or in the heart of the Father, and then he brings out of the heart of the Father the, the nature of the Father. He reveals to us the Father's love. He reveals to us the Father's truth. He reveals to us the Father's compassion. He reveals to us the Father's plan. He reveals to us that the that Father is perfect. His ways are perfect. The Son shows that to us. He ab abiding in the bosom of the Father, like the first diagram here, these three circles, he is in the bosom of the Father. When he comes, he shows us the Father. And we behold him as of the only glory, the only one who could come and show us the Father. We actually see it. We behold it. We recognize it. It grows. It affects our life. We see it. We believe it. We are very honored to be part of that and to see it and under, to, to, in some measure to understand it. We'll, we'll look at that in a minute. Okay, now go to the um, Gospel of Luke in verse 9. <clears throat> and I have a paragraph here. The son forsook, this is the appearing of the world's redeemer. The son forsook the splendor of heaven and became as really a man as ourselves, surrendering the eternal form of God above all, wor above all worlds. He voluntarily entered into human relationships within the world leaving the free, unconditioned, world-ruling absoluteness of the divine form, the Son entered the limits of time and space of the creature. The eternal Word became a human soul and emptied himself of his world-embracing power as ruler. The self-seeking mind may hold with tenacity even strange and unjustly acquired possessions as being welcome prey. But he, the primary fount of love, did not regard even his own original and legitimate possession, the divine form and divine position, as something to be maintained at all costs, but surrendered it in order to save us. He descended into the lower regions of the earth, Ephesians 4, 9, so to take us redeemed with and in himself up to the heights of heaven. God became man that man might become godly. He became poor for our sakes, that we through his poverty might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. So when this happened, here's angels now. Angels were created before the material world, before God said, let there be light. He created angels, Job 38, 7. The angels saw creation. It's as if there's nothing there, and then God, whew, he created the material universe. The angels saw it. They, you know, when you see something, you own it. Like you see it, you saw it. I was there. I saw it. So the angels learned something when they saw it. They learned something. They are, they are curious. They are learning they are being instructed. We know that because 1 Peter 1, 12 says that they, that they look into the things regarding redemption. When we are preaching and living the life, when we are manifesting the 
Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is manifested among us. The angels come and look into it. They look into it. That little phrase, looking into it, is like the cherubims on the mercy seat looking down at the mercy seat. They were looking at it. Mercy. Mercy seat. The blood on the mercy seat. Well, this is a picture of how angels are, are interested. They are watching God do his work. Because when God does something, it glorifies him. Like the girl playing the violin or, you know, somebody wearing a hat. Like those human pictures of like, what is God doing? What is God doing? God is saving a soul. What is God doing? That saint came here into heaven. That, that saint is given a crown. And that crown goes back to God because God did it. That, that's, that's something that happens in heaven. Like God, they, then they go, they see more, and they say, glory to God in the highest. This is in the text here, chapter 2, verse 9. Lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, fear not, for behold, I bring you great good tidings of great joy. Now, if you were an angel and you said this, you have something in your, in your understanding as an angel. Like the angel couldn't just say it like a machine. He's saying it from his heart. He's saying it, he understands this. He's saying it's unbelievable that the almighty, sovereign, omniscient, powerful God would be so humble to come and be a man to save you. What? To save you. There's no salvation without that. There's no way. That's why I, I said earlier that for 4,000 4, years up until Christ, there were sacrifices, there was practices, there were the tradition, the institutions, there's a priest of the tabernacle, but none of that could save a man. Nothing could save a man. That couldn't happen. Abraham was justified by faith, but where did he go when he died? He went to Abraham's bosom. But who could go to heaven? How could man get to heaven? It had to come through blood, but not the blood of an animal, but the blood of the Son of God. And the angels are now seeing that what? That this babe is the Lamb of God? This child incarnated, this incredible Messiah, this Savior? I, I, the angels are... I'm, what I'm trying to say is the Bible is unfolding itself. And even up to this point, I, I, it's very possible that the angels had no way of understanding and knowing what was really going to be happening. But now it's happening. And when you experience it, it's like you're, they're full the angels are full of this, this praise to God. It's an amazing sense. Let's read. It says, they were, you know, the angels said, If you're not, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For this will be preached to all people. It'll be declared for a couple thousand years. They didn't say that, of course, but we know it's been that time. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Then go down to verse 13. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Oh, I wonder, verse 14, glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, 
goodwill toward men. Now let's go back, let's go to the unsaved here. Unsaved, you could say, is their goodwill toward the unsaved. Yes, God saved, died for them. Yes, yes, the, 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 he, he died for them. But the weight of their own decision-making, the weight of their own life, the weight of like being blind and suffer. As for the unsaved, except when you're a child, even then the suffering can be great, but generally children are very close to like a good life. God is good to the children. He cares about the children. But as the sin increases in their teenage years, so they taste the misery and the fears and the self-consciousness. And as they go through their 20s and their 30s, and sin bites like a viper, and depression happens, and failure and broken hearts and broken relationships, God is reaching out to the unsaved. And he's saying, are you sick of it yet? Do you know where it's going? Do you know you have no way out of this? Your life is vain. Your life is miserable. Do you know? You can pretend. Yeah, yeah they all pretend. Everybody that we have are the games we play. But deep inside, on a Friday night, when your head is on the pillow, and you're alone with yourself, do you love yourself? Do you accept yourself? It's strange. We do. We're the ones that forgive ourselves. We give forgive ourselves much more than we forgive other people. Well, we forgive ourselves, but it still creeps in. And you say, I shouldn't have done that. And why did I do that? And I think I'm on a bad road. And I don't know what's happening to me. And I wonder where I'll end up. Oh, it'll end up fine. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. All, always it goes like this. Well, is there a time when you would realize you don't have peace? God has goodwill toward you, but you don't have any response to him. You are blind. You are arrogant. You are selfish. You are lost. Do you know that? Do you realize that? So this is how people live. They live like that all the time. Everybody, everybody. I mean, all kinds, millions, billions of people. They have their religion, they have their habits, they have their life, and yet, yet God is saying that I love you. I am for you. The angels in heaven are saying, we understand this. We understand that man is made in the image of God, but we have seen that man is lost. That man's life is vain and miserable, and he can't wake up. We are the angels. We see this. We see they are lost. We see they go to hell. We are the angels. We see this. We saw God become incarnated because of love that they see it more clearly than we see it. And yet they come and be with us because they're curious. They want to see what God is doing by his grace. I don't know if curious is the word. They are interested. They are anticipating. It says in Hebrews chapter 10 that Jesus is anticipating for his enemies to be under his feet, though they are not yet under his feet because we have demons, another category. Let's turn to James 2, and we'll finish up here. I think we have a little time. James chapter 2. I just realized this, this uh, last night, about 3.30 in the morning, I was studying because I had the time to do it and felt like it. It says about verse 19. Did I say 20? 2.19, James. 
Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So we, we have demons. I'll put under, under, we have unsaved men, unsaved people. And that's a subject in itself, I understand that. We're just touching on it, but they are there. They are here amongst us, unsaved people. And we have demons. Demons are spiritual. They are fallen angels. They know a lot. Are they wicked and evil? Absolutely. Are they liars? Yes. Are they misguided and they're blind? Yes. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Demons understand the spiritual world. They have been in heaven. They've been cast out of heaven. They're on this earth. They know. They know God. They have seen God. They know. They know about heaven. And by the way, when Jesus confronted them in the Gospels, they also knew about hell. And they said, don't send us there now. Don't send us there. Wow. Do you know that when Christ was incarnated... Do you know that the demons were aware of it? They became aware of it. How do we know that? Because the devil is a murderer. And he was in Herod. And Herod pretended. He was a tyrant who was uh, narcissistic, addicted to his own praise and love and love for himself. And when he heard that there was a king of the Jews, it shook him. We read that in the Gospel of Matthew. It shook him. Like tyrants are insecure, paranoid, afraid of competition and being overthrown. He was afraid, so he murdered all the children two years and younger, as you know in the story. Demons were after Christ to kill him. Demons were aware of what in the spiritual realm. It was a spirit, a demon-possessed man in Mark 1 who was the first one to identify him as the Holy One of Israel. What do you have to do with me? Depart from me. I have nothing to do with you. Did you come to torment me? There were three things the demon said. And depart from me, thou Holy One of Israel. He, the demons knew who Jesus was. Yeah, they're they're not stupid. And the writer here says, you believe in God, good for you. Doesn't mean much. The devils believe in God too. But it doesn't do a thing to save them. Believing in God is a normal thing for the human race. And believing in God, you have to be educated or totally arrogant absolutely blind by your arrogance not to believe in God and fear God, right? And that's the way we are until we are born again. When we are born again, now we have a connection with God, and we are now, like on an angel level, so to speak, we are in the game with the angels, and the angels are learning. They are. They're learning They're seeing it, and so are we. We are learning also. And by the way, what happens as you grow in your faith is that you become very happy and satisfied with what you're learning. I am learning that. That's amazing. I enjoy that. That, that's, That's it. I get it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for the little crown on on the head, that's fine. But this is another crown. This is a spiritual life where you're understanding the value of your faith and growing in your faith from faith to faith. So the angel said to the shepherds, go and see. And they did. And that's a good point, too. The angels want you and I to move in our faith, act in our faith, go and see. And then when the shepherds saw, they're like included in the thing. They're included in it. 
I want you to be included in what God is doing. I want you to realize I want it for myself. I, we enjoy it. And you might say, well, I'm, I'm not exactly knowing exactly. I'm not sure. Just abide faithful. Walk by faith. Abide faithful. God will show you. It's a journey. It's a pilgrimage. I think tonight I'm going to preach about being a pilgrim, what it means to be a pilgrim uh, in this life. This is not our home. We're coming back to it. We're coming back and taking over. But right now, we're just passing through. We're passing through, but we got some joy, information, insight, understanding, and we're very much honored by God to be part of that. So that's it. That's it for the message. So we got, um, um, let me just say, this, this little list. We talked about God, the angels, saved man, demons, and unsaved man. And our heart is broken for the unsaved. Our heart is broken for them. Oh, Lord, please help us do something. Just help us to open our mouth to speak as we ought to. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> Lord, we uh, read the scripture and are persuaded that behind those scriptures is an unfolding story that greatly glorifies you. And we are in it. We are in it. We are part of it. We're going to grow in it. We're going to make good decisions. Live by faith in you. Trust you. Give us the grace so that we can live the kind of life you called us to and glorify you and honor you. And anyone listening, we, we want to give you the invitation, please, to as many as received him. To them he gave the power to become the children of God. Receive him today. Put, write down the day. Write it down and say, this is my spiritual birthday. This is the day I decided. This is the day I came forward in my heart and said to God, I take your son. I believe in him. I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Tidings, oh tidings.
times of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Wow, wasn't that good? Wow, yeah. All right, let's pray. Mm. Father God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the glory of your incarnation, Lord, that we can be partakers, Lord, of your glory, that we can glorify you, we can submit to you, we can serve you, we can love you, God. So thankful for that, Lord. We just pray now as we leave, protect us on the roads, Lord. God, um, bless the 11 o'clock service, Lord. The service tonight at 6.30, Father. The service Wednesday night at 7, Lord. God, this Christmas season, Lord. God, we are just um, looking for you, God. We are beholding your glory, Father and um, expecting great things this season. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.